Welcome to round two of our Q&A. You guys sent in some amazing questions and it was a lot of questions. So I'm dividing them into manageable chunks and we'll be going through them each week to make sure I answer everyone's question. All right, so on our second round today, um, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in and we're gonna start talking about abs. So question number one is, best exercise to target all my abs at once? Now, I love this question. Most of the people that I see, they either need more TAs or more internal obliques or more external obliques. Like we usually have to uh, finesse the ab work that they're doing to preferentially get one um, subgroup of abdominal muscles working more than another because they tend to have an abdominal balance. So getting all the abs to work at once together is actually quite easy. One of my favorite exercises for doing that is forced expiration. So when you breathe out hard, your TAs are the first to show up for forced expiration, which is great, we need them to work. And then your external obliques come in and pull the ribs down. Your internal obliques and rectus help to squash your pressure system through the middle. And so have you ever tried to blow up a stiff pull float? Or how about the last time you had a cold and you had to cough quite a bit? Think about how sore your abs were after coughing. <laughs> how much of a, ab, you were like, wow, this is really a big ab workout. And so having that forced expiration makes all your abs show up. So you can either add balloons, uh, if you don't want to uh, create more plastic for the environment, then you can get a breathing trainer online. They're relatively inexpensive to do forced resisted uh, expiration. So give that a shot for just getting all your abs. That's a great idea. But if you get some lower belly pooching or you have more some back tightness after trying to do abdominal work, then that's a sign you could have an abdominal imbalance. And so that would be something to take a look at. Question number two, this is a question after my own heart. I love this question so much. Thank you so much for submitting this question. I have a prolapse and I'm wondering how to prep my body into running again if possible. Now, I love this because it's someone who has prolapse and also thinks running is a possibility in her mind. I love it because so many of the women I see that get that prolapse diagnosis just think life is over, this is devastating, but to have someone with that kind of hope already, love it so much. And I do think you can get back into running. I don't know exactly how much you're gonna to have to do <laughs> to be able to get there and to be able to get there safely and well so that running is something that helps to continue to improve your prolapse, which is possible. Uh, so I wrote out a whole lot of notes. I have a lot of notes here. And I wanna go over those because I wanna give you kind of a big picture. So if you were to come in and see me or start my online program, here is the thoughts that I would go through. Here's what I would want you to look at with your body and here's what I would want you to address. So we're gonna start at the feet and we're gonna look at overall strength. Okay, so how strong is your support system for your pelvic floor? Your pelvic floor is in the middle of your body. Okay, it helps to support your pelvis, your SI joint, your spine, as well as all your pelvic organs, uh, and how well the muscular system surrounding your pelvic floor works, uh, especially for shock absorption, because we're looking at uh, running as impact, is going to determine how much uh, support or lack of support your pelvic floor gets. So when you think about your feet, how are your arches? How strong are your arches? Are your feet collapsed or do you are you able to really contract your arches well? And then likewise on that, are you able to eccentrically control your arches? So what I mean is, is if you do uh, contract your arches up, are you able to control lengthening that arch down well or do you just kind of crash down? Are you like rigid and tight and then crash? Or are you able to control that? Because that eccentric control is part of what really helps with shock absorption. How are your glutes? How are your adductors, okay? Uh, how are those hip muscles? How are your hip range of motion um, as far as being able to strength-wise to move into different ranges of motion? Um, so good for the pelvic floor, for the hip to move through a variety of ranges of motion during exercise. How are your abs, specifically your lower abs? Your lower abs really help for your support system for your organs, okay? So how are those? And then when we go up the chain a little bit, we look at what's your upper body like? Do you have good serratus? To really help pull your scapula through as you go to transfer energy for your run or do you tend to be kind of all neck and shoulders which is going to end up putting more pressure down uh, so what does that look like so basically your weakest link is going to come out with something that is repetitive 
repetitive actions, no matter whether it's your job where you're taking something and putting it here or hammering something, or you're running, which is repetitive, foot over foot, over foot, over foot for a period of time. Uh, it's a very repetitive action. As we know, repetitive action brings those imbalances up to the surface. It highlights them. And so somebody either gets stronger and does well, or they get injured, which is a lot of times you see like elbow injuries from using the computer, you know, things like that that are repetitive tasks. And so depending on what position our body is in and what muscles are using determines how that repetitive task, the outcome of that repetitive task, I guess you could say. Uh, so that's why running is so hard. It's because it is one of those repetitive tasks. Now, speaking of just the pelvic floor, what is your pelvic floor strength like? You're gonna need a lot of endurance because uh, running is something you want to go and do for more than two minutes. <laughs> so you're going to need a lot of pelvic floor endurance, um, but more natural pelvic floor endurance. You're not going to want to be able to hold a pelvic floor contraction for the entire time. You're going to want to let your pelvic floor do its thing, but that means it's going to need to have a base level of strength, which might take a little bit of building and it might take a little bit of pelvic floor contractions to get there. Likewise, you want to make sure you don't have pelvic floor tightness because pelvic floor tightness is gonna make it difficult for the muscles to contract well. Uh, and if muscles can't contract well, they can't give you support. Okay, so that, that could be an issue. All right, so check on pelvic floor strength. Do you have fast twitch strength? So as you run, you hit, and that means you have to have fast twitch strength to be able to hold up your organs, meet that demand very quickly. All right, so both endurance and fast twitch strength. How do you manage pressure? So when you run, your external obliques should be working <laughs> to help transfer that energy through from your scapula as it moves on your back. Your scapula should be moving as you run. Um, your serratus contracting and those external obliques contracting and that transfers energy down to your legs to help your legs move, which is a really cool system. The faster you move your arms, the faster your legs will move, uh, which is kind of fun. But also the more pressure your pelvic floor might have to handle. So uh, how are you handling that pressure? What is your breathing system like? What is your alignment like? Uh, so if you run with very good posture, kind of a nice forward lean, head in line with your body, um, and that's gonna help you transfer energy to your pelvic floor. Well, go ahead and do that with me. So come up nice and tall, give me a little forward lean. Um, that should feel good on that pressure system. Now kind of slouch, tuck your bottom under, let your hips come forward, and then let your shoulders go and let your head go. Watch people run. You're gonna see people that run by, head forward, fully slouched, sloshing by, lots of pressure down, and then you're gonna see the people that are up and forward, and you're like, oh, that person's pelvic floor is probably in a lot better shape. All right, so think about your posture when you run. What does your form look like, and how much does that form help you control pressure on your pelvic floor? So you're either lifting up pelvic organs, or you're putting pressure down on pelvic floor organs, which brings us to what does your form look like at the beginning of your run, and what does your form look like at the end of your run? Okay, so this is where I have had patients where uh, they've gone for a run and it has taken their prolapse from a grade one to a grade two. Okay, they have significantly made their prolapse worse from a run. And then I've had patients that whenever they feel some prolapse symptoms, they go for a run and then magically their prolapse completely just sucks back up, goes away and their pelvic floor feels marvelous. Okay, so what is the difference between these two people? All right, think about that, that you can have two people with such vastly different reactions to running, and that has to do with their base strength. So I like to think about it as that curve, right? You've got to get to this critical set point to where your body is strong enough to run, and then once you're to that critical set point, uh, then you're, it's great, you're great. Running is just gonna help your pelvic floor get stronger, that motion, that pressure, um, the, the, the strength needed, it's just gonna continue to help you improve your prolapse every time you go for a run, which is so cool to think about. But if you're not quite strong enough to handle running, uh, and you end up putting too much pressure down on your pelvic floor, more than it can handle, then you can end up really causing your prolapse to get worse. Um, and so I think this is an important thing to understand that uh, running requires strength training. At least in my book it does, because uh, you need to be strong to run. Um, and so making sure that you are doing a really good strength training program uh, before you run and when you are running, during your running to keep you strong, I think is an incredibly important part about running. So make sure you have that. Okay, let me check all of my notes to see what I am leaving out. Um, so just know that running really can be beneficial for the pelvic floor, which is why when somebody says, can I run with prolapse? I'm like, yes, but can you run today? Ah, uh, let's rethink that. So it could be one of those things where you just need to put in a little bit more work and then you'll be right to running very soon. Um, make sure that you're 
running back to running program is appropriate, meaning you don't go from two miles to four miles <laughs> and making sure you don't go from zero to two miles, okay? So that you uh, increase no more than 10% a week, cautiously, carefully, all that good stuff, and you don't do too much too soon. Uh, make sure that your strength training program does the same thing. Uh, and you just want to make sure that you are meeting that critical threshold to get better. So sometimes I see people with prolapse that are a little bit too cautious and they never move forward with their strength. And that is actually their undoing uh, because they're not pushing that envelope and they're not getting stronger. So finding that sweet spot to where you are meeting that critical threshold, but you're not pushing yourself into lots of setbacks. Some setbacks, sometimes completely normal. You learn from them. You make changes based on them, and then you keep moving forward. But if you're creating lots of setbacks, uh, that can be an issue. Now, I do want to talk for a second here about uh, pessaries. Pessaries can be good. Um, they can also be a hindrance to healing. So I see them both ways. Uh, if you're very early on postpartum, uh, sometimes your tissues can need a little bit of support. If you've done your work for your strength base and mentally you just really need to run, then maybe putting in a pessary for that, especially early on postpartum, uh, can be a really good idea if you just have to run. Um, later, postpartum down the road, when I'm working with someone, I usually don't want them wearing a pessary for exercise because I want them to be able to feel what their pelvic floor is doing. Now, there's all sorts of different cases for this, um, but... Uh, and so sometimes I'm, I'm absolutely for it. So this is not one of those all or nothing situations, but I often find people either use it as a crutch where they bear down into it and they're like, yeah, free for all. It's going to hold up my pelvic organs. I can do whatever I want now, bring it on. And then they just do whatever they want without paying attention, but they're still using that really bad pressure management system. They're just thinking, ah, I've got a pessary in, it's fine. I'm not going to make myself worse. Their prolapse never gets better. It never gets better. And they're like, you know, they're the candidate of put the pessary in and then maybe surgery later. Like they're not doing anything really beneficial for improving their prolapse. Uh, so they can't feel what's going on and they often use it as that just free for all. Um, so that is a bad scenario for using a pessary. The other scenario would be if it causes increased tightness, um, which would then cause your muscles not to contract well. So if it causes irritation, it causes tightness. Uh, things like that, then we want to look at it as well. So just make sure that if you do use it, you are not in the free-for-all category of just bearing down and not feeling and all that stuff. So you guys probably know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, and uh, with that, so I'm not giving an all or nothing opinion. I'm just saying it's something to think about. We want to use tools like arch support and shoes, like a pelvic organ support, um, as good tools when needed we want to wean ourselves away when not needed. We might not want to use it all the time if we're working on strengthening, like I will get somebody out of their arch supports for their shoes, for their feet, um, while we are doing arch strengthening exercises so we can really focus and feel. But then if they've got to go, you know, walk around with their kids for some, you know, special thing and they're going to be pushing their bodies a little bit further than what they're used to and they're going to fatigue out a little bit, then absolutely put the support in, wear it. Uh, that is when you need it. That is when it's good. But if it's for, you know, the everyday free for all, then that's when we want to reassess. So just using a little bit of common sense there. So hopefully that comes across as I mean it <laughs> um, for just thinking about things and thinking about why we do things um, instead of just uh, doing it and then assuming all is going to be fine. Okay. So that is wrapping up that question. Those were a lot of things to think about um, for running with prolapse, but you can absolutely get to the point where running is beneficial for your prolapse. Running makes your pelvic floor feel better. Um, it helps build additional strength and it is a good thing for your body. So I fully believe that. So it just might take a little bit of investigative skills and a little bit of work. All right, so have fun with that. All right, question number three is I have an internal rotation of my right hip. Uh, maybe I've always had it, but it became an issue when I injured my back last July. Ended up learning I have four bulging discs around the L2, S1 area. Um, is there anything I can do to minimize the pain I experienced in my hips? I'm so sorry. That just seems like a whole awful lot to go through. Uh, the most relief I experience is when I'm in a passive squat position. Okay, so a couple things here. You want to rehab your back uh, because your back can be referring pain to your hips. Okay, so making sure that you are in a good back rehab program, working with a great physical therapist for that. Okay, and it sounds to me like your hips are really craving opening. Um, so if you do better in squatting positions, 
you are opening that hip socket. You're moving the femur back in the socket. You are opening your glutes, opening your deep hip rotators, opening the back of your pelvic floor, which makes me wonder, do you have some tightness back there? Do you have piriformis tightness? Do you have tightness in the rest of those deep hip rotators? Uh, so maybe working more adductor strength, inner thigh strength, um, abdominal strength, obviously is gonna go hand in hand with that. Uh, so maybe looking at some more things that can naturally open that. Uh, in the free Happy Hips series, I talk through um, how to uh, kind of re-get some internal rotation in your hip. I think that would be a really good video for you to watch if you'd really like that. So I'm going to link that video uh, as well. And then finding a Postural Restoration Institute trained physical therapist in your area, because uh, this is what PR does really well. They are all about those hips, all about right hip external rotation. Uh, so I think you would be in great hands there. Uh, so finding that therapist I think would be really good. They have a search uh, function on their website. I've taken a bunch of their classes and I love their approach to this. Uh, so give that a shot. Okay, question number four. I have been experiencing both urge and stress incontinence since the birth of my son six and a half weeks ago. My doctors keep saying it's normal until I hit six months like this. Uh, I lose my full bladder sometimes, so I'm living in diapers. Can you imagine changing your own diaper at work? That must be really, really hard. Uh, I've had periods of time where things are better, but when it gets worse again, but then it gets worse again. My only theory is that it gets worse after I take a long, faster than normal walk. See, this is great clues. You're paying attention to your body. You're paying attention to what's happening, and those clues give physical therapists ideas of what's going on in your muscular system. So um, great job with those clues. Or was that? However, my doctor says that it's not the walking making it worse to keep walking. Um, any thoughts on what may make it worse that I should avoid doing um, in an effort to help myself? Anything more than Kegels. Uh, glutes and hip exercises I should do. Um, I'm getting desperate and frustrated. I know not everyone's the same, but any possible tips or thoughts on what might be happening? I'm all ears. Okay, I do have some tips and thoughts for you. Um, lots of them. So that was great clues, a great way to um, kind of pull that apart. Uh, so what I'm thinking is that this is not normal. <laughs> okay, having some a little bit of leaking very early on or losing your full bladder once, maybe twice, can be normal, um, especially in that early postpartum period or like when you have a freak bad cold or something, you know, and, but if it's not a regular thing and it's not something you're worried about happening all the time, then I wouldn't worry about it. Freak things happen. But if it's something that sounds like it's more regular, um, than happening occasionally and something you are really concerned about, uh, you need, to, something needs to happen. And this is what pelvic floor PT is for. Uh, you can get a script right now to go to pelvic floor PT. You're, I mean, you can get one two weeks postpartum. You didn't even have to wait until six weeks. Uh, so seeing the pelvic floor PT in your area, I think would be a great idea because what I think is happening is I think you have some pelvic floor tightness. Um, that's just my guess because walking, especially swift walking, really recruits the pelvic floor muscles, okay? Uh, and so you're getting increased activation. And so if you are worse after a swift walk, that's telling me that you probably used your pelvic floor for the walk, normal, good. Uh, and then that created some tightness, but tightness makes it really hard to contract and control the pelvic floor, which then means you increase your risk of leaking. Uh, so <laughs> what I would do is I would work on the tightness. Um, it can also cause urge incontinence as well. So if you have that sense of urge incontinence, then that can be a sign of tightness as well. The other things that can be happening during the walk are uh, forward head posture, upper ab gripping really creates a lot of pressure down on the pelvic floor, which then in turn can cause more tightness. Uh, so, but it would be different if you were saying it was exacerbated during the walk, not after. So during the walk, we probably look more at your posture while walking, what's happening with your pressure management system, what is your breathing like while you're walking. Of course, we'd wanna look at your breathing while you're walking uh, anyway now because that's gonna control the tightness of your pelvic floor, um, the end result after your walk. So if you make sure you breathe down while you walk, I guarantee you're not breathing down. I bet your breathing is going straight up into your neck and shoulders. Uh, so make sure you breathe down for your walks. I think that would really help. Uh, and then uh, what is that pelvic floor tension like? So finding out if you have uh, pelvic floor tightness, um, there are some clues you can have. Like if you inhale down, do you kind of feel like you've hit a brick wall? 
uh, or do you feel like you have a nice soft give to your pelvic floor and then it comes back to your resting state after your inhale. So if you don't kind of feel that connection and that soft give, you just feel like you inhale down and it all comes out your belly and you can't connect with your pelvic floor, that's a sign that you have pelvic floor tightness. More extreme signs of pelvic floor tightness are pain with penetration, which you might be getting back to that point since you're six and a half weeks postpartum, although there could be a little bit of pain anyway, just naturally that first time. Uh, but um, pain with insertion, difficulty starting uh, urination. So if you kind of sit on the potty and you're just like, all right, come out, ain't time now, incomplete uh, emptying of your bladder where you feel like you have to pee, but it doesn't all come out. So those can all be signs of pelvic floor tightness. All right, so um, see a pelvic floor PT in your area. Um, check out the online program. Um, get some help, go get some help. Go get somebody who deals in muscles, okay? Doctors are amazing. I have had some great doctors in my life uh, over the years that I highly, highly respect. They are not muscle experts, okay? So physical therapists go to school, become muscle experts. So check out, go talk to a muscle expert. All right, question number five. Uh, thank you for this video. A couple questions if you don't mind. I never had popping sounds in my shoulder until after becoming a co-slipping mom and falling asleep with my arm over my head, waking up with a numb arm. Yeah, so when you press on the nerves, they go numb just like when you cross your leg and then your foot falls asleep. Okay. I made sure with babies two and three to not let that happen. Yay, good job. Uh, the popping is present but painless. When I do chest press, um, resistance band pulls. She gets some popping in her shoulder. A uh, very helpful tip I received from my online coach. Um, Haley Shevener, um, she's awesome, love Haley, uh, was to use and gauge more of my entire scapula, perfect, so you're moving your scapula instead of just moving your shoulder so you're not shoving that forward, very good. Um, am I, am, oh, let's see, where was I, all right. Uh, which I'm thinking employs the help of the serratus muscle. It can, yes, depending on which movements you're doing. Uh, am I right in thinking this? Uh, it has minimized and at times eliminated the popping sound, though I can make it sound even when just laying in bed, um, slightly moving my elbow forward. I also watched your hip popping video where it says to just adjust the angle or motion, and that has helped as well, so thank you. All right, yay. Okay, so already great thinking. I love that you're going down these lines. I think that's really awesome. Um, I do think that you probably, so popping is, let's start there. So popping is just usually simply when a tendon is popping over a harder structure, like a versus sac or the bone, um, which tendons shouldn't pop as their normal line of pull, their normal movement. So usually you get popping when something's moving a little bit uh, abnormally. Now, whether that ever ends up in turning into pain or a major problem, who's to say? I only see the people where it does. <laughs> That's my job. Uh, so I am inclined to work on things when you start hearing the popping noise. So I'm glad you were on the same page with that as well. All right, so what I would recommend you doing is loosening up your rotator cuff and your lats, all right? So you're getting in here, foam rolling underneath your arm, that Terry's can get in a nice knot down in there. And that can help free up to encourage that scapula to move more. Then I would work on serratus versus chest. So I have a feeling from all the snuggling, um, your chest up here is fairly tight. Uh, so continuing to open that release pec minor and get that serratus to work through. So I'm gonna link a video for you there to look at uh, for increased serratus work. I think that would be really good. Uh, so I love that you're working on that. Um, I want you to continue to work on posture and alignment during exercises. So make sure that you think about where your head is. So not just moving more with your scapula, which is great, but also join that with where your head is positioned and so if you kind of pick your head up a little bit more that changes so if i'm here that's going to push my shoulder forward elevate my scapula but if i kind of perk my head up pulls my shoulder open and back a little bit um, naturally helping that system move through okay so continue on that really great serratus um, train um, if you're still getting a little bit of discomfort sleeping on that arm maybe use a higher pillow to help take up some of the weight off your head uh, and um, continue on that path of loosening and strengthening and see what happens because it sounds like you're pretty close because you don't have pain you just have popping so you might be right there you might just need to add uh two to three serratus exercises three times a week to make sure that you're meeting that quota of overload for that muscle group uh, and then checking to see how you do i absolutely love the foam roller up the wall exercise uh, so i can link that one for you here as well i think that would be really good Okay, question number six is, Hi, I just finished your free online lectures. 
Love them. Yay, I'm so glad. Uh, personal question, I am 15 months postpartum. Something happened in my hip at some point during pregnancy and maybe delivery. So left internal rotation is less than 10%. Uh, losing left internal rotation is actually quite um, common, so you were in good hands there. Um, left knee crepitus, constant calf muscle tightness near the back of the knee on the outside. Um, I need, really need to start some cardio, but anything more than five to 10 minutes uh, brings all these symptoms back. So gotta love a kinetic chain, right? Um, I love it sometimes when I'm trying to fix something because we can look lots of other areas, but it is a giant pain uh, when you just wanna feel good. <laughs> um, okay, so cardio is repetitive, very repetitive. So if your system is not, uh, if you got a few, I like to call them cheaters, just cause you know, it's a good word for them. So if you got a couple cheaters causing things not to move and pull quite like it should, um, then you're gonna end up with pain with repetitive movement, which is what you're feeling. All right, so a couple things I would like for you to think about. One is that that left hip needs to move back in the socket. Okay, so I tend to find if you're missing internal rotation, you're already kind of stuck up and forward and there's nowhere for it to go. And so you're gonna be ramming into your psoas, you're gonna be ramming into your labrum, <laughs> tissues that are not happy. Uh, so oftentimes people will get a pinching or impingement uh, in the front of that hip. Um, I, in the um, happy hips free course, I don't know if you got to that lecture where I was talking about pulling the femur back in the socket, so that can be really good. Working left adductors can be great. Uh, so that is really good. I've got a pullback video that's from the Posture Restoration Institute that is on YouTube. I am gonna link that for you because I think that would be a great exercise for you, possibly a magical exercise. Um, the other thing I'm gonna want you to do is check out your tibial internal rotation, so your lower leg. Uh, since your knee is also bothering you and find out what's happening at your lower leg. Uh, so how is your left arch strength? Does your left arch want to collapse? What's happening with that tibia, that lower leg, to compensate for your arch is probably collapsing and then how is that transferring up to the hip? So it's not all about the hip coming down, although it can be about the hip coming down, um, but you can also have that effect up the chain as well. Uh, and then look at what's happening with your breathing system. Do you have any rib flare? Do you have strong abdominals on that left side? Uh, working lots of left glute medius can be helpful, especially those anterior fibers of the glute medius. Uh, so lots to unpack there and work on for you to start feeling better. Thanks so much for joining me for this Q&A. And I am out of time today, but I'm gonna be back next week and I'm gonna answer another great list of questions. Thank you so much for sending in these amazing questions and I will be back to get to more of them to help um, just encourage you to keep working on your body. So thank you so much for joining me.